we've discussed the, the attack thoughts in the mind, we've seen that, that the ego is trying to play a trick with the mind and cover over the original attack thought with these other surface the attack thoughts to generate the fear, but we've also seen from all these, everything we've been talking about today, that that until you go deeper and you get down to the core, the core attack thought, and let that, you know, feel everything with that and, and allow that to be released from your mind, that, that these tricks of the ego will seem to go on and they will seem to be, they will seem to have real consequences. Not that they really do, it's just a, a tricky, it's a false belief and a false world that it made, but it, it will seem to mesmerize, it will seem to be, have a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies, you know, the, the attack thoughts playing out over and over in a very convincing way. And you can see how the, that inward movement is where the healing occurs, because you have to get down to facing that original attack thought in order to be free of, of fear completely or free of symptoms in that case. The symptoms will just seem to occur in diluted forms over and over and over as long as that central belief in attacking God is still down there. And, you know, it's just so, so pushed out of awareness. So the attacking God and in competition with God is the same? Yeah. It's the same, yeah. To believe that I can be in competition with God or to attack God is the same. And you see, we go back to Jesus' divine logic. I am not a body, and ah, there's the second line. My mind cannot attack, therefore I cannot be sick. It's key that that middle line is so important because if, if it's possible that attack is real in any way, shape or form, then guilt would be real as well, and innocence would be impossible. So we have to get down to that core belief, because if, if attack thoughts are real, then guilt is real, and then sickness is real. You see how he, he's running it down two different ways. He's saying, here, we're going to trace it in with divine logic, and as long as you believe that attack is possible, then you will have guilt and you will not know who you are, and you will not know God, you won't know your Creator, if you believe that. So, that's why it's not a matter of defending yourself against a real attack, but it's actually a matter of going deep enough where you have to realize the impossibility of attack. That's where this is all heading. That's what forgiveness is all about, is recognizing the impossibility of attack. My mind cannot attack. And in order to do that, he does mention that in the workbook, that the way that the ego protects that, those, that belief in attack is it seems in this world like attacking and being attacked are two very different things. It seems like one, being the attacker is being the aggressor, and being the attacked is being the victim. See how the, he splits the attack into two different camps? two different possibilities, and then the mind just constantly seems to go through this time-space world, flipping back and forth from attacking or being attacked, from being the one that does harm to being the one that is harmed. You know, flip, 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 and eventually you have to start to realize that they are both the same, that they are, it's still this belief in attack, even though that's part of the trick that keeps it preserved, you know to feel like a righteous victim, like, no, I really was mistreated or whatever, then the ego is sitting back there going, ha ha, got you, got you. Or this, I will, I will get back with revenge, I will show them, I will attack, you know, as if there's some kind of strength in attack, the ego is sitting back there going, ha ha, got you again. The strong aggressor or the weak victim, it doesn't matter to the ego, it's the, it's the same, belief, the belief in attack, that attack is possible. So, that really is, is what we're calling enlightenment, is, is coming back to the point where you <coughs> have an experience and a realization of the impossibility of attack. That has to be the only solution. That's the only way that divine innocence can be experienced. You can't experience attack as being real and experience innocence. 
You know, that's what the world would try to say, oh, we found the attacker, we locked him up in prison and we threw away the key. Now, you innocent victim, you are free. We have locked up the perpetrator. What? That's not, that's just a trick. As long as there's somebody who's guilty and jailed and imprisoned, how could you really be innocent? You know, if it really happened, you know, how would you ever find safety in, in, a, in a battlefield where there's attack and defense all the time? The only way is going to be going deep enough to recognize the complete impossibility of that competition with God and of attack. Yeah, and, and again, exposing it. Uh, if we hide the attack thoughts, from ourselves or from Mighty Companions, if we have that agreement to expose private thoughts, that's what keeps it real in our minds. It's, it's really this willingness to feel it and bring it to light that dispels the reality altogether, and then we can forgive it. It's the hidden stuff that dri drives us and controls us. Noel, when you spoke about complete surrender to whatever's going on in your body, would that have included, well, whether I'm healthy or sick, neither of those bodies would be real. Mm -hmm. So, in that surrender, that would be a recognition of that. Yeah. I think that came up too when we were, we went to Cincinnati and and the, the cough from hell came up to like every... <laughs> the hairball hair from hell. hell. It was like every so many seconds. Because as it started, it was, it was irritating. Then it became even more irritating and annoying. Then it started to get more and more serious in the perception like, uh-oh. And then difficulties speaking or singing. There was no, no singing voice. That, that completely left. And then as it continued on and progressed after that, it was the ego again projected out into the future. We even were, were going to be heading to some gatherings and, and one of our friends, Ken Kelly, had, who's a singer and, and record producer who produced uh, Hell on the CD. Yeah, he, he basically said, I can come, I'm coming with my wife to Florida. And when she was going through this great coughing spell, she's like, there it is, the Holy Spirit's replacing me already. Uh, that now we've got a substitute coming in. This was like what, a week and a half, two weeks or whatever in advance. Yeah, and I was diving into, I'll never sing again, you know, because they, my vocal cords were feeling so thrashed. And here's proof. Yeah. yeah. I already got to I was like, I was like saying, well, this is great. But this is a great emptying of the self-concept. <laughs> it's like you really believe that you need to be able to sing to be loved. And I said, I think you're perfectly lovable, uh, singing or not singing. And you were able to get in touch with like, this is, wow, this is really an opportunity to loosen from that self-concept as a singer. A CD had just been recorded, all these, carrying all these Union CDs in the suitcase and everything, and then no voice. <laughs> it was this sense like, oh, I, then David or the messengers, they won't want me around anymore if I can't sing. It'll just be, I'll be just tossed away like a piece of trash, you know, like, huh can't sing. Well, too bad. Nice, nice going there, sister, but it was nice knowing you. Can't sing. You know, and so... Singing but, for my supper. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it was, it's got, but that's what we're doing. We are getting down to the self-concept. Mm -hmm, yeah. And it was a very deep dive, because then after it passed through, it was also giving yourself the time and space, you know, to go through a period of like a little bit, a little, gargle a little, sing a little, you know, it was not that, you know, she woke up the next day after the dark night of the skull, the soul, and you were just singing and singing like a lark, you know, it was, just had to be very, very patient, patient, patient. It took three weeks. It took three weeks for the singing voice to come back. And it just gave her time to really take a look at that self-concept investment, and it's, I think that's just continued on. It that, that's just another self-concept that that it's a skill that the Holy Spirit can use in a glorious way, and that the Holy Spirit also says, "Just remember, it's not who you are. It's my skill to use now. It's not yours. And if you try to possess that skill or 
attach to that skill and identify it, it, it can only hurt you. So, you know, that was a pretty strong lesson. It was. So, trust is key. I mean, when you're on this journey, you see you have to trust that everything that seems to occur, you have to, like, there has to be the full embrace of it. Otherwise, you just are forever avoiding things. Avoiding this, avoiding that. You know, you really do, then you just kind of put a, kind of a, a protective shield around your personality self and say, no, I'm just going to live a very limited, uh, safe, secure life. Like when you were talking about with the chronic fatigue, how you were just, your time was just trimmed down to, got to get to bed early, can't do much, can't go very far, you know, really limited, feeling really handicapped and trapped and saying, but I have no choice. You know, because of this and this and this and this, and then the ego just is sitting back there going, huh, I've got you scared, and that's the way it likes the mind to stay scared. Because the mind won't open up to miracles if it's too terrified, it will just keep all the shields up, defense shields up and strong, you know, guarding against the, that possibility. <laughs>